I love these talks because you make, they just end up feeling very personal. Like you feel like you get to know, get to know the, the person. It's really cool. Um, okay. Well, I'm going to, I'll give the tee up introduction to our next speaker, but then I think Tom probably, maybe you'll want to say a little introductory piece too, but um, Judy Jacob is a senior conservator with the National Park Service, uh, Historic Architecture, Conservation and Engineering Center in New York. And she <clears throat> worked primarily on stone monuments and masonry buildings in the Northeastern United States. Um, and she has a long-term research project on the relationship between lichens, biofilms and the stone <clears throat> and stone, sorry, as they uh, relate to material degradation and preservation. So I think um, Tom got to know Judy, I believe at Eagle Hill, is that right? So tell That's us a correct. little bit. Yeah, tell us a little bit about, I just wanted to get, you know, get those facts uh, on the table, but Tom, you can probably give a more personal introduction, but Judy, thank you so much for being here and you know, I'll let Tom say a few words. Yeah, and I would like to thank Judy for agreeing to come speak to us as well. I, um, I had first met Judy at Eagle Hill Institute. That is a place that um, dedicates itself to adult nature studies. It's on the coastline of Maine, not too far from where Rachel Carson used to reside. And um, uh, Judy is one of the co-teachers of a course up there that I believe she does biannually or um, every other year that uh, is um, about uh, the same subject matter that we're going to hear about tonight. And uh, I couldn't wait to take it. I'm into lichens. And uh, whenever I saw it offered, I couldn't wait to go up there. I've been to uh, Eagle Hill a few times and it is just an absolutely lovely place to visit. Coastal Maine is one of my favorite places. And I became quick, fast friends with Judy. We got along just like peas and carrots, like uh, Forrest Gump and uh, Jenny did. And, uh, and uh, we've been friends ever since. The, um, and uh, I thought that uh, her life's vocation would make a very interesting talk for our membership. And it kind of fits neatly into this theme about talking about conservation and preservation. Now, those are big, those are terms or big umbrella terms, uh, and they take on a lot of different meaning. But uh, preserving our cultural heritage, heritage definitely falls under that. So looking forward to hearing more about it and seeing some serious eye candy of all the beautiful monuments that Judy works on, practices her craft. <laughs> I'm liking it already. <laughs> <laughs> With that introduction, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm really pleased to be here tonight. And this is not a mushroom talk. I know everyone here really likes their mushrooms, but um, something a little different and we'll see what happens. Um, before I begin my talk, I want to get some definitions out of the way. So a conservationist is an advocate for clean water, forests, elephants, and songbirds. The individuals working in the field of conservation are biologists, soil ecologists, lobbyists, and educators. A preservationist is an advocate for historic buildings, neighborhoods, landscapes, and monuments. The individuals working in the field are architects, urban planners, conservators, lobbyists, and educators. A conservationist advocates for planting trees. A conservator stabilizes, repairs, or restores a carving made from a tree cut down a long time ago. I am both a preservationist and a conservationist by avocation and a conservator by profession. I will share my screen. Okay. All right. So like all of you, I like going for walks in the woods and looking for mushrooms. I love bringing mushrooms home to my frying pan. Sorry, Tom. I love it. Some of you like going for walks in the woods to look for lichens, but not me. I like looking for lichens on monuments. 
There are 423 units of the National Park Service. I work on monuments, buildings, and structures in the Northeast region. And for this presentation, I will call them all monuments. Over the course of my career, I've worked on the large marble monuments that you see here, and many small monuments like these gravestones in rural Pennsylvania. Tonight, I'll be talking about marble, lichens, those orange things, and biofilms, this black stuff. So as a conservator, I am concerned with the longevity of monuments as well as their appearance. How do we respect both the artist's intent and the passage of time? Do lichens and biofilms contribute to the deterioration or to the protection of marble? Do they serve as umbrellas protecting marble from rain and weathering? Or do they serve as jackhammers crushing crystals or both at the same time? These are unanswered questions. Can we learn about marble monuments simply by observing surface conditions with our own eyes or aided by a hand lens? The answer is yes. This is the rock cycle, a complex diagram that illustrates how rocks are made, how they change, and then change again and again. Marble is a metamorphic rock formed in the bottom right, found in the bottom right corner of this diagram. Very briefly, little creatures floated around vast primordial seas, died and sank to the bottom. Their skeletal remains piled up, became compacted, cemented and lithified to form limestone and dolostone, both classified as sedimentary rocks. Limestone being calcium carbonate and dolostone being calcium magnesium carbonate. With the heat and pressure of colliding continental plates, these same rocks changed, metamorphosized to form marble. Lithified skeletal remains became interlocking crystals of calcite and dolomite. Carbonate crystals are angular and fairly soft, measuring three on the Mohs hardness scale. They're susceptible to dissolution in acid. The rain in DC is about a pH five now. Slowly and over time, rain dissolves marble. Impurities in the carbonate matrix produce beautiful colors. And unfortunately, I will just be talking about white marble as it is the most common building marble in the United States. The monuments I will be presenting come from marble quarries in the states with the red stars. Some of these quarries closed long ago, some are still in operation, and those in Vermont and Georgia being the most active. What does one need for a marble quarry? How do you get stone out of the ground? In addition to the stone itself, one needs iron for tools, fuel for blacksmith forges where tools are made and sharpened, quartz sand for sawing, and a means to transport stone to building sites. The earliest quarries were outcroppings or ledges where blocks of stone could be pried out and loaded onto carts or boats. We have marble in New York City that was quarried in the 19th century. The overburden, that part of the area closest to the surface of the earth, the uppermost layer of stone is undesirable for building due to its lack of cohesion and many fractures. But still in 18th century Vermont, the marble of this former schoolhouse was pried from the earth and cut into rough blocks. And you can see the fissures and cleavage planes marking a material that had been subject to the stresses of the Earth's surface. Here you can see drill holes used to extract the stone from an old quarry in Western Massachusetts. This is white marble. The gray color is a biofilm. And I'll get to that. In 1863, the Wardell Steam Channeler was introduced in Rutland, Vermont. Parallel channels, channels were drilled into the stone from above. 
To split the stone into blocks, wedges were rammed into drill holes at the bottom of the channels. The first commercial quarry in Vermont was opened in 1836. Dorset had a seemingly endless supply of marble, water power, sand, fuel, and a railroad. In 1880, the Vermont Marble Company was formed, and by the beginning of the 20th century, had become the largest corporation in the country. Stone from the Danby Quarry is being harvested one and a half miles below the ground. It is hard to imagine just how much marble was and is quarried in Vermont. Americans celebrated their marble, but still, Italian marble was often seen as superior. If I see a reference to Italian marble, I never assumed that it came from Italy. We're now in your city. In 1853, the year of this illustration, hand tools were used for cutting and carving stone. The depiction of the Washington Monument grounds shows saws, mallets, and chisels. By the end of the 19th century, pneumatic chisels had replaced hand chisels. While there were mechanized polishers, young boys were employed for most of the most, the most mundane tasks, sanding marble to remove chatter marks from saws and creating a, soothe, a smooth satin surface. Because of its abundance, appearance when new, and relative ease of cutting, marble was commonly used for monuments. Marble ensured posterity. Except that it really didn't. This is exactly what caretakers don't want. Surfaces are no longer white and smooth and edges no longer sharp. The marble has eroded, a natural and inevitable process and a bioreceptive surface has been created. The surface that provides the perfect living conditions for lichens, which you can barely see in this photograph, and biofilms, the black covering. I often bring a marble sample on site visits. My sample is from Danby and has a sanded finish. It is a tremendous aid in explaining that no preservation treatment will make a century old or even decades old monument appear as it was when new. So I, I'm going on about marble maybe more than you expected or wanted, but in order to understand what grows on top of it, you have to understand a little bit about the marble itself. So what happens to marble once it is taken from the ground, sawn into blocks, maybe carved and placed outside? Weathering is defined as the physical and chemical changes brought about by temperature fluctuations, ultraviolet light, moisture, and pollutants. For Shard Villa, gray marble was used for the body and white marble for the coins or corner pieces. Over time, the coins have weathered, making them practically indistinguishable from the body. Blocks of Colorado marble on the Lincoln Memorial have turned yellow. Iron compounds within the stone have oxidized. These blocks are at the very top and are not immediately visible from the bottom. This gravestone is bending, and two years later it had toppled. Daily and seasonal temperature fluctuations, hot, cold, hot, cold, lead to microfissures between crystals. When temperatures rise, carbonate crystals expand in one direction and contract perpendicularly to that direction. When temperatures fall, the opposite occurs. Such movement causes internal crushing and fractures. As these microfracture populations grow, they comprise the structural cohesiveness of a marble block. Like osteoporosis in an older person, loss of structural cohesiveness in bone leads to hunching over and eventual toppling. In marble, microfissure networks also increase porosity and permeability and increase the extent to which the marble can be wetted by rain and condensation. Moving water erodes stone. 
Oh, oops, I just missed something. Erosion is the loss of material due to rain, acid deposition, temperature change, wind, and ultimately gravity. The rounded white mountains of New Hampshire remain from the last glacier, which ground down the once jagged peaks. Airborne abrasives erode stone, much like very slow sandblasting. Moving water erodes stone. Fast moving or pressurized water does the job faster. And salts are enormously erosive. Here you can see the salt zone by the white salts and also by the eroded stone in these areas. Notice that the stone at the bottom is in really good condition. Drying is just as damaging to stone as wetting. On the left, the marble steps have been eroded by thousands of feet going up and down. On the bottom right is a good example of sugaring, where crystals are no longer tightly locked together. And on the top right is a good example of differential erosion brought about by natural forces and cleaning campaigns with unknown chemicals. In 2007, I cleaned a set of garden urns in Maryland. We use soft brushes and low pressure water for rinsing. In the end, the urns were white and we had souvenirs of our effort right in our hands. What else affects the surface of marble once it is out of the quarry? Everything that is airborne, here exaggerated with a storm of dust. Pollutants, primarily acid compounds, contribute to the erosion of marble. There's no way this beautiful lawn and trees would have survived adjacent to the Blow and Kennett Company factory. In 1966, New York City was not a healthy environment for citizens or its marble monuments. This environment began with coal burning for heat, continued during the industrialization of Soho, use of cars and leaded gas, and was not lessened until the Clean Air Act of 1970. Brought, uh, enacted in part because of Silent Spring. I never thought I'd see my city this way. Until, of course, last summer's wildfires in Canada. The output of pollutants as a result of the Industrial Revolution are now the output of fires that will likely become commonplace. These two gravestones date to the 1820s. The gravestone on the right is in downtown Manhattan and has eroded to an illegible status. The gravestone on the left is in rural Virginia, where pollution levels were and are considerably lower than those of New York. While marble likely came from different quarries, and New York has greater temperature fluctuations than Virginia, it would be difficult not to attribute these differences to pollutants. It would also be difficult to attribute the erosion of the New York stone to lichens and biofilms. This handprint is from an eight-year-old boy after he came in from playing outside. Our monuments are always playing outside. They're covered with both microorganisms, life forms that we cannot see with the naked eye, and be like bacteria, and organisms, things that we can see with the naked eye, like lichens. The tree of life as many of you know, is comprised of three domains. Eukarya are multicellular organisms whose cells have a nucleus and distinct organs. Bacteria and archaea are prokarya, single cell organisms whose cells have no nucleus or distinct organs. I will not talk about this entire tree, just three kingdoms and one domain. Organisms and microorganisms in the plant kingdom are phototrophs, obtaining nutrients from the sun through photosynthesis. As you know, fungi are heterotrophs, obtaining nutrients from organic matter. Animals are heterotrophs too. Members of the animal kingdom have roles in the health and ill health of lichens and biofilms, but it's not something I know much about. The bacteria domain contains at least nine kingdoms. Cyanobacteria-like plants 
use photosynthesis to obtain their nutrients. Most other bacteria are heterotrophs, but not all. Viruses, while not a life form, are members of microbial communities and are not well understood in those communities. So I've used the word biofilm, what is it? It is a community composed of many species of microorganisms held together and to their substrate by a self-produced sticky polymeric matrix known as the extracellular polymeric substance or EPS. Primary community members are phototrophs, cyanobacteria, and heterotrophs, bacteria and fungi. The EPS protects the community from stress, prevents desiccation, provides for the transport of nutrients, waste, and loose DNA. They are enormously complex as this diagram establishes. I will point out just one thing, the persister cells, number four there. Um, persister cells survive after exposure to a toxin and all chemical cleaning agents used in the preservation industry, fall into the category of toxins. You can't kill a biofilm. You can reduce it, you can't kill it. So maybe some of you have heard the lecture on cheese rinds. If not, it's a good talk by, I forget his name, at Tufts. The cheese rind is composed of a multitude of genera of bacteria and fungi with each type of cheese made up of a different community of different community members. And each monument is just as complex. So each one of these vertical striations lines is a different cheese with all of the bacteria and fungi genera mapped out. Here's a biofilm on the eroded marble of Memorial Amphitheater. The term film is somewhat misleading. Biofilms do not form an, an all-covering film like paint, but exist as strands of film in between crystals of eroded marble. Black pigments, gynomins are one group, are produced by some microorganisms to, produce, to protect their DNA from solar radiation. So from now on, I will use the term biofilm to mean biofilms producing black pigments. There are plenty of microorganisms on the surface of any stone, but we just can't see them. Biofilms need sun. The fact that we are seeing more biofilms on monuments, especially in urban monuments, in urban locations, might be attributed to the Clean Air Act. Possibly the reduction of particulate matter in the atmosphere has resulted in an increased solar radiation Confocal laser scanning image is of a biofilm from the Lincoln Memorial. The blue blobs are phototrophic communities, the green blobs are heterotrophic communities, and the red strands are the EPS. The gravestone on the right has streaks of black. The gravestone on the left has a uniform matte gray covering, something I've only seen or only seen thus far in rural locations and it too is a biofilm. The more I look at eroded marble and biofilms, the more visual variations I find. I visited the Carrara marble quarries in Italy a few years ago. My friends marveled at the bright white marble. I marveled at the black biofilms. This is a Carrara grout pile, discarded rock fragments by the side of the road. They are almost uniformly black, and with bright sun in my sunglasses, they looked even darker than what my camera captured. They were pure black. I have no idea of the age of this grout pile and how long it took for the biofilm to form. Finally, lichens, fungi kingdom. I know you've all been waiting for lichens. These are symbiotic organisms with fungi providing the structure and the name and a photosynthesizing partner, algae or cyanobacteria providing nutrients. The thallus is the visible body of the lichen. 
Folios lichen take the form of tiny leaves. They have a top side and a bottom side. The Gordon Cemetery is on the coast of Maine. Xanthoria parietina, the orange lichen, is only found in marine environments on calcareous substrates. This is a very simple diagram of a lichen. And you can see thread-like structures of the fungus called hyphae and the algae cells. You can see how the hyphae create the thallus, envelop the algae cells, and secure the mass to the substrate. Hyphae position themselves in recesses between crystals. They, they're not like tree roots. They don't grow down deep. They don't push. They just are hold fast, just holding on to keep themselves there. Crustose lichens lie flat on a surface, barely protruding from the substrate. They only have a top side. Lichens are substrate specific. Only some grow on calcareous materials like marble and also limestone, concrete, and mortar. Crustose lichens are often called endolithic lichens, growing within a stone. However, a stone, whatever stone it is, is not a uniform solid mass with an easily defined surface. Eroded marble has no clear boundary between exterior and interior. Lichens are also often blamed for causing the erosion of stone. To that I say, there are environmental forces far greater than lichen acting upon stone. When I look at lichens, I don't see pits or evidence of partial erosion. Here, I see no difference between what was once under the lichen and what lies outside of it. With the thallus having once covered the upper left of this image. I wonder if these circles are the sites of former lichens. I wonder why the biofilm hasn't moved in. Or if there is a biofilm, why it isn't producing black pigments on these spots. I see faint circles of green algae um, and even sort of a bullseye target. And is there a time factor involved with what's happened on the surface of this stone? Or are there microtoxins or viruses in these white circles? The folios lichen on the bottom left is growing under the lip of a coping stone at Memorial Amphitheater. It is found under the entire lip, but nowhere else. In this location, it is protected from the sun and will be slow to dry after a rain. A short distance away, the coping stones of the Jefferson Memorial have a drip edge cut into them. It's a horizontal channel running the length of the stone, and it prevents water from running down the parapet. The water rolls down the face, hits the drip edge, and falls straight to the ground. And in this area that's much drier than that at Memorial Amphitheater, there are no lichens under this coping stone. This gate was constructed in 1796 of New Jersey sandstone. You can see the stone in the very bottom left corner of the image. And the rest is a red pigmented mortar, a calcareous material covering the deteriorated stone. Yellow lichens, Candelariella aurelia, grow on the mortar and not on the stone. This little fragment is now a garden decoration. It is cataloged as a sandstone piece. However, the covering lichens only grow on calcareous materials. And this stone is marble or limestone. You just can't see it. Lichens can be used to aid in the identification of stone. The orange Xanthoria parietina on this granite post is surprising as it only grows on calcareous substrates. In fact, it is growing on a calcareous substrate. It is growing on the mortar of the joints and on calcium carbonate runoff from the mortar. On the right is an example of Lecanora Lecan dispersa, growing on the mortar of the drum of the Jefferson Memorial's dome. 
I have a problem with a common name published by Erwin Brodo. Mortar is set between blocks of stone or brick. It has nothing to do with rims. Also, mortar and rim form a compound adjective for lichen, and the hyphen properly goes between mortar and rim and not between rim and lichen. Keep scientists away from the creation of names. Otherwise, Brodo is to be praised for co-authoring the most magnificent of lichen books. Memorial Amphitheater was built of Danby marble. The parapet has a blotchy appearance with white and black areas in a seemingly random arrangement. Calcitic marble erodes to form boulder fields of rounded crystals. The biofilm is situated in between the boulders. That terminology is all mine. In small, seemingly random locations, matte gray biofilms cover the crystals. And this tiny crustose lichen is only visible once you start looking at the surface from a distance of three inches or so. What I could see with my hand lens, and maybe what you can see here, is a little mound of crystals slightly elevated with the lichen on top, the lichen seeming to hold these crystals in place. So it's sort of the opposite of a pit. It's actually holding something in place, maybe. In 2017, I performed a series of biofilm reduction tests on the amphitheater. What we were not expecting, what we were really shocked to find, was the development of these white spots out board of the tests. And here, birds are not involved. I have never seen birds up on this parapet. Each spot is surrounded by a little rim. It has been suggested that a virus might be involved, somehow preventing pigment production in these locations. There are also white spots on the top surface of these panels, essentially making visible the very beginnings of a biofilm. When I visited this memorial, it was a mere seven years old. Federal Hall National Memorial is located on Wall Street in New York City, completed in 1842, the largest building in downtown New York, or all of New York. Foundation, walls, columns, and roof slabs are dolomitic marble quarried just north of the city. And my office is in the basement. The roof is covered with a biofilm. And with this biofilm, rainwater runoff paths can be observed. The light streak originates at a point under a, the metal walkway where elements have been set together with lead. Likely the water of this particular path contains just enough lead oxide to inhibit the biofilm's growth. Those bright white panels are later additions from the 1950s. Dolomitic marble erodes to form craggy little mountains. To my surprise, the roof is covered with lichens. Candelariella arella again, um, of the, like the mortar on the, the granite post in Maine, is a pollution tolerant species. I wish I knew if they were present or not during New York's worst pollution period. The black material in between crystals and in the fractures is a biofilm. Of course, everything else that has fallen from the sky is caught in these crystals as well. Carbon particles, pollen, spores, salts, pulverized organic matter, etc. On the right is one of the crystals from the roof. The red blobs are phototrophic communities and the green blobs are heterotrophic communities. The communities sit right on top of the crystal with the EPS holding them in place. As part of my research into understanding the relationships between marble monuments, lichens and biofilms, I've made a collection of writings describing observations. In 1703, the compiler of four French dictionaries 
wrote about the goddess Mercia and her statue in Rome. Mercia, the goddess of sloth and idleness, her statues were covered with dust and moss, dust and moss to express her sloth. I am interpreting dust to be a biofilm and moss to be either or both moss and lichens. In 1799, an article describing cleaning attempts of statuary in France was translated into English and published in London in the monthly magazine. I quote, those who are charged with cleaning the public statues at Paris and Versailles have found it difficult to select proper materials for this purpose. It was lately demonstrated that this adhering substance which, which disfigured the marble was not dust, but a kind of lichen or moss, which by attaching itself to the statues thus disfigured them. I am hypothesizing that the quote adhering substance was a species of vericaria, a black crustose lichen. I love looking for lichens and biofilms in museums. And here they are, streaking down walls, following drip trails of water. In 1817 and 1818, Charlotte Eaton wrote a series of letters describing her time in Rome. Of this pyramid, she wrote, quote, time has changed its color and defaced its polish. The gray lichen has crept over it. So this pyramid was cleaned a number of years ago and is no longer gray, but I'm curious to see what's coming back. To better understand rates of marble erosion and the development of biofilms, I've been comparing historic photographs with present conditions. For this gravestone, it is easy to see the advance of the biofilm, which also indicates the advance of surface erosion. But does erosion continue once the biofilm completely covers the surface? I don't know. This gravestone is in the same cemetery. I only noticed the change in appearance while I was going through my photos for this talk. I have no idea what all these little spots are because there aren't lichen there. Um, there weren't lichen there in 2008 or 2010 or 2019. So in the Vermont Marble Company brochure, Bottom bases of all finished work will be of inferior marble and sand finished unless otherwise ordered. I wish I knew the meaning of inferior marble. The bottom block of the gravestone is granite. The three upper blocks are marble, as is the small stone in front, the footstone, that used to mark the foot end of the grave but has been moved back. If, quote, inferior marble is used for bases, it is likely used for footstones too. And if inferior marble erodes more quickly or more readily hosts the biofilm, I would love to know why and how that was determined in the quarry or in the stone yard. This is the same gravestone. There's clearly a relationship between the lichens and the biofilm. Both ebb and flow, the biofilm seems to change its density while the lichen seems to be lessening. And they are both competing for sun. There's no overlapping here. Marble monuments are greatly affected by everything we do to keep them clean and solid. Cleaning operations attempt to remove dust, dirt, and any unwanted material. Water and detergents are common cleaning materials. Also used are many different chemicals and abrasives. Here, something like an alkaline lime wash was applied to gravestones, likely in an attempt to whiten them. In 1959, this gentleman applied a liquid preservative to a camel outside the Seattle Museum of Art. I wrote to the museum asking for information on this treatment and they had no record of it. While I would like to think that mystery, quote, liquid preservatives are not common, I know better. More recently, several years ago, 
A waterproofing agent was applied to this freshly cleaned statue at Versailles. Waterproofing agents are designed to fill pores and microfractures, repel water, and lower the bioreceptivity of a surface. In theory, these agents are a good idea. Reality is a different story. Algae is an informal term for a large and diverse group of organisms and microorganisms in the plant kingdom. They photosynthesize and produce the green pigment chlorophyll. I don't know if the waterproofing agent is supplying nutrients or if we are seeing the paths where it is worn away by rain. At some point, I don't know when, preservation practitioners and the preservation industry started attributing stone deterioration to biocolonization. Very simply, warfare was necessary to protect stones from lichens and biofilms. About 15 to 20 years ago, I began questioning all of this. In 2004, I conducted a cleaning test on the backs of three gravestones. I used water for the stone on the left, calcium hypochlorite, a common cleaning agent at the time, for the stone in the middle, and a product that was new to the market and contained quaternary ammonium compounds, or quats, on the right. Initially, the quats product was the most successful. 10 years after cleaning, the biofilm has mostly returned to all three stones, and something else has happened. By this date, a lichen population was clearly visible on the stone cleaned with quats a population that was not there initially. Aristotle's adage, nature abhors a vacuum, holds true. By removing one community, another community moved in, and or the decomposition products of the quats create a food source for the new community. In 2010, these gravestones had been recently cleaned. I don't know what was used, but I do know that I found an empty container of bleach, sodium hypochlorite, in the trash nearby. Seven years later, the biofilm is returning, just to be expected. So does this mean another cleaning? And with each successive cleaning, we are eroding the stone. And are we also creating more robust biofilms, more tolerant of stress? Remember those persister cells. So I've given you a very brief introduction to the weathering and erosion of marble monuments and to the lichens and biofilms that inhabit those surfaces. I should say that lichens are far more numerous um, in genera um, other stones, granites and sandstone. So I'd be much more pleased to look for lichens on those stones. So I've strung together many of my observations. I will now end with a few thoughts for moving forward to understanding monuments and also for plain old rocks in the woods. For starters, I want people to look closely at substrates, monuments, rocks, whatever, pay equal attention to lichens and to the area left behind when lichens fall from stone. Pay attention to biofilms and their patterns. These high school students have been studying the biofilms on Memorial Amphitheater for their senior project in the Biotech and Life Sciences Research Lab, then directed by Mary Susan Burnett. As part of a National Science Foundation grant, small weather stations were placed on the roofs of the Jefferson Memorial and Federal Hall National Memorial. Weather data was correlated with metagenomic data of the biofilms to better understand their activity. Federica Villa on the left is a microbiologist now at the University of Milan. Isaac Clapper with his back to the camera is a mathematician at Temple University and the recipient of the grant. David Bitterman on the right was an architect with my office and well-versed in environmental monitoring equipment. In recent years, the north and east sides of Dorchester Heights Tower have darkened. The color is due to lichens, not a biofilm. Three years ago, Michaela Schmuel and I conducted a lichen survey of the tower. 
Michaela, a lichenologist and director of collections at the Harvard University Herbaria, expected to find about five lichens, and we found 10. The National Park Service is now planning on using the lichens as a teaching tool. And that means that along with talks about George Washington and the Battle of Dorchester Heights, there will be talks about lichens and the environment and the aging of stone. And I think that's pretty exciting. Here, a lichen marks the location of a tiny fissure. We can use lichens to identify fissures that might be too small for our eyes to readily detect. I have to wonder too, if the lichen actually retards the amount of water entering the fissure. So will it ever be possible to permanently remove biofilms or to prevent them from colonizing surfaces and keep our monuments white? And if these white dots are an unpigmented biofilm, or if a virus is attacking the biofilm, can a monument be inoculated as a treatment? It seems improbable. Will it ever be possible for caretakers and visitors to accept life forms existing alongside our monuments? And personally, I'm quite fond of this cemetery. I would love to go for a walk. And finally, I wrap this up with a Renaissance baptismal font in the garden of the Vanderbilt Mansion National Historic Site, north of New York. This baptismal font and its biofilm is representing the National Park Service on the cover of microbial ecology. I'm just thrilled with that. And thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you so much, Judy, that was terrific. Um, I loved the picture that you just showed um, of, the, of the, it was looked like a graveyard that you said you would like to walk through. You know, I'll just say like, I always get so sad when graveyards clean their headstones because we love walking around graveyards. Um, this was this was just amazing. I, I know I learned so much. Let's check the let's check the chat and see if you all have questions. Feel free to jump jump on and ask them, and also feel free to put them in the chat. Whatever whatever is best. Let's see, okay, I see one. The Jefferson Memorial Dome was restored not too long ago, Christina said. Can you comment on that restoration? I knew someone would ask that. Yes, the Jefferson Memorial Dome started turning black, sort of remarkably so, and maybe over the course of 10 years, just got darker and darker. And the Park, Serv and the, um, the Park Service made the decision that the Jefferson Memorial needs to be white, and after a number of tests, it was not my project, so I can speak to it just a little bit. It was subject to laser ablation, um, like those, those rectangular tests that I did at Memorial Amphitheater. And the laser ablation plus um, low pressure hot water or maybe steam successfully removed the dark color. But, um, you know, I cringe, it's gonna come back. And then what do we do and what comes back? It's, um, it's really complicated. You know, it's one thing to walk through a cemetery and say, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we had all these colors and, you know, this represents time and the passage of time. It's another thing for the, you know, for Washington and its monuments to somehow not have white monuments. It's, it's complicated, it's very complicated. And did I answer the question? I think so, yes. You have another question from Megan Romberg who said, has anyone had success in growing biofilms in the lab? And as a corollary to that, have any viruses been found in biofilms as you alluded to in the case of the white circles? So most biofilm research is done um, in uh, is done for human health, medical schools, medical institutions, and for oil pipelines. Um, what I'm looking at is 
subaerial biofilms, SABs. So biofilms that have contact with the air. And they are barely studied. It's um, So it was someone uh, in a medical program who told me that yes, viruses are a part of that, but I don't know her research or that right now we're just sort of trying to figure out the bacterial communities and not everything else. Um, oh, I'm sorry, what was the second part of that question? The second was, um, have there been any viruses found in those white circles or in other biofilms? Oh, we've, um, we haven't really started looking at those white circles. And in order to find a virus, you'd have to know what you're looking for. Um, right, right now, I would say we're over our heads in just looking at the black stuff. But we all just wonder what is going on with those white dots. Well, I know biofilms are very, like you said, extremely important in medicine, especially now that we have people living with more and more hardware kind of inside of them. And, you know, we're able to do incredible things with devices like valves and catheters. And it becomes very difficult. And like, it, it's kind of interesting to me what you said about the biofilms kind of being these communities of many different organisms, you know, um, it, I guess it makes me wonder because I always heard of biofilms in medical settings kind of being like staph aureus or you know one other kind of bug but i wonder if yeah, i wonder if it's a similar issue um someone is marilyn mandel or mandel is asking can you please ask if if she so do you advise everyone to stop cleaning gravestones i would i would say that um that's me speaking um outside of the park service, but in the park service too, with my park service hat. Yeah, let's let's stop cleaning or slow down. Let's decide what we're doing. You know, are we really contributing to erosion over and over again? Do we absolutely need things white? Um, If we need to read something, can can a document online with the names of everybody in the cemetery be the way to honor the deceased and, and let their names live on? Um, and all those chemicals that are used for cleaning, they just go into the ground. And in Silent Spring, there's a chapter on dirt and the earth and it's an organ of the earth. Let's. Let's not just send everything into the ground and say, oh, that's fine. So I think there's it's a complicated issue with many stakeholders. Well, Mitch uh, just asked, so he noted that he sees biofilms growing all over the gas pumps at work, and he thought maybe it was some kind of fungus. And he wondered, you know, could the biofilm be getting nutrients from the fumes of the gas? Oh, um, I mean, I think everything is possible. Um, you know, first, first come the phototropes because they don't need anything. They just need the sun. And then come the heterotrophs. And what they're living off of, don't know. Oh, I know, one. the second part of that other question was, can they grow in the lab? Yes, Federica Villa has produced a biofilm in the lab um, with just two organisms, a heterotroph and a phototroph, and they've produced the EPS, the extracellular polymeric substance, and it has stayed living for a couple days. So, yes, maybe she's got it to live for a little longer now. Um, yeah, Basically, living off the like, fumes of the gas, I don't know. I basically wonder, are there any, has anyone tried to use biofilms? Like, because I, it seems like people are talking about a lot of situations where they can be either problematic or perceived as destructive, but, you know, are there situations where people have tried to harness the power of biofilms? I don't know. Um, perhaps a little bit in that if you had an annoying cough 
and you went to your doctor, you might be prescribed antibiotics. And now you're gonna be on your deathbed before you get antibiotics because that biofilm in your system needs to, it needs to be strong. You, you can't knock it out because you're gonna, um, you're gonna weaken yourself in the long run. So that's a little bit, the answer's a little bit twist, twisted from your question. No, that I um, I I know I know what you're saying. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, we have to keep them in some places. Yeah, that's very interesting. Let's see. Um, let's see. Christina mentioned the only other biofilm research she had heard of was related to biofilms inside of drinking water pipes. And let's see. I don't see any other questions in the chat. But does anyone have anything they want to? I mean, really, if, feel free to just ask if you want to. Well, it's a, I guess it's an ask, but first, Judy, thank you so much for coming tonight. Man, it was awesome. It was so much fun uh, hearing from you thank again. You, Tom. And know that you have an open invitation to come to DC anytime. Please reach out to me and we will arrange a walk. Uh, I'd love to do a building stones of the National Mall with lichens and biofilms being featured with you sometime. Also, the, we awesome. could go to the ruins, like the Rock Creek Park ruins where they have all <gasps> of the, where all the old stones.